Well, for uh, an officer to use that amount of meat or pepper spray on kids. Then, mixed reaction to a new employment training deal. That would be good, but what's that really going to do for us? The people who are looking for work. And will amalgamation get things moving? I would use it to go for doctor's appointments. I would be able to go shopping. Live from the ATV News Center at every city and town in the Maritimes. Steve Murphy, Steve Weigel. This is the ATV Evening News. Good evening, everyone. The RCMP in Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia, are being accused of police brutality tonight. They are denying it. Dozens of teenagers were pepper sprayed and restrained after the police responded to a disturbance at Cole Harbor High School last night. Here is ATV Star Dobson with our story. What started as an argument between two girls ended in violence Thursday night. Two members of the Cole Harbor RCMP responded to a call from a school dance here. Police were confronted by a crowd of teenagers and say one officer was punched in the face, another hit by a bottle. Subsequently, other members started arriving on the scene to help out. One of the original three police officers has revealed to me that one of, someone in the crowd of students in the hallway was tugging at his revolver. Three other detachments of the RCMP responded, as well as Halifax Regional Police. We sent approximately 16 units, which uh, consisted of about 20 police officers. One student suffered an asthma attack and dozens of others were pepper sprayed. Today, many parents say police overreacted and some believe their response was racially motivated. It's, it's blatant brutality. Glenn For, Kane's son uh, was pepper sprayed. He believes police should be held accountable. We will pull together as a community and we will make sure that justice in this case can be served. People are saying that it is racist. You know, I, I, I don't buy into that because they were strictly responding to people who were aggressive and fighting. Ironically enough, it was, however, an incident witnessed by Canada's justice minister. Alan Rock was riding along with Halifax Regional Police last night. Rock says he was both concerned and disturbed by what he saw. Classes resumed here at Coal Harbor High School today without incident, and many students told us they believe this whole fight is being blown out of proportion. And they're tired of all this stuff that people saying that we're like always fighting and we're racist because it's not true. Don Trider is the superintendent of the Halifax Regional School Board. There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, hurt feelings, a lot of anger that uh, has to get out and that's what I was hearing uh, today. Five students were charged with obstruction, three of them adults, two young offenders. They'll appear in court in January. Now Steve, we asked police what they'd do differently if they were called to a similar situation tonight. Corporal Hubley told us they'd probably handle it the exact same way. But that's not good enough for some parents, though, who are talking about laying charges of police brutality or taking complaints to the Human Rights Commission. All right, we'll be following the story, of course. Thank you, Star. Thank ATV you. Star Dobson from RCMP headquarters in Halifax tonight. A 16-month-old baby has been killed in a tragic accident on the Eel Ground First Nation. Emma Marie Ganesh died when her uncle accidentally drove over her with his truck. The girl's family was decorating the house for Christmas when she ran onto the driveway as the truck was being moved. The largest union at the St. John Dry Dock has a new offer from the company on the table tonight. The latest round of negotiations wrapped up today. A key issue of trade flexibility was addressed. But the Marine Workers Bargaining Team will neither recommend acceptance nor rejection of this new package when the members get to vote on it probably next week. I would have to say that there's movement as far as what the company's prepared to move at this time. And if there's any more there, we don't know. And uh, like I say, the membership will make the decisions on it. The shipyard president, Bill Haggett, says it's a positive sign that the union will present the package to the membership. He says a deal to build merchant marine ships is still on the table should the company and its unions reach a contract agreement. It was another day of protest and walkouts at a number of schools in Cape Breton and northeastern Nova Scotia today. Parents and students marched at schools in Cancertown, Monastery, Shetty Camp, and in Harbor Bushy. Most are upset with the school board's plan to close more than 20 schools across the region. 
because these are our children. They belong in our community. The school board does not have the right to take our children out of our community. A school board statement says time lost because of the protests this week will be made up later in the school year. Premier McKenna says it will now be easier for unemployed New Brunswickers to get trained for new jobs. The Premier has just inked a new deal that will see the province take over job training from the Government of Canada. Over the next three years, the Feds will give New Brunswick $228 million to cover the costs of running this program. Prime Minister and the Premier. This will allow New Brunswickers to access the programs and services they need to realize their full potential. This will reduce uh, and eliminate duplication and overlap. This new job training program, first reported here on the ATV Evening News last week, will begin in April. Now, ATV's Tanya Miller has spent the day today talking with unemployed New Brunswickers to see just how they feel about the new deal. And what she has found was a very mixed reaction. Aaron Hershoff has been unemployed since graduating with a degree in urban development last year. But today's announcement that the McKenna government is taking over training its unemployed and designing its own programs has raised many questions. The whole idea of focusing on fishing and forestry is good and it's proven a viable economic development solution in the past. But what about people who don't have those skills or interests? Stephanie Dixon agrees. She's an unemployed makeup artist open to the idea of retraining. But she wonders if the province will offer the same variety of training as is available now. If they're taking over like all our other programs, like are they going to offer like the same type of programs that unemployment insurance could offer us, you know, like while we're on it? But others like the move. Peter McKeegan is taking a wait and see stance. I think it's good. I think it'll it'll help it'll help a lot a lot more unemployed in, in, in New Brunswick than it is now. According to the province, the new deal with Ottawa is about more than home-style job training. It will also mean a reduction in the duplication of services. Okay. Premier McKenna says yeah. that means one-stop shopping. Under the old federal system, unemployed New Brunswickers often had to travel to two or three locations for counseling, training, and financial assistance. Where we will establish priorities in consultation with the federal government. But in the end, it will mean that we will be able to control our own destiny as far as... Meanwhile, the government says before the new system is up and running in April, there's still a number of issues to solve, such as where the new centres will be located. In Fredericton, Tanya Miller, ATV News. Well, it looks like some of the politicians are getting a little sensitive about the, about the expression BS tax. New Brunswick Legislature House Leader Ray Frenette lambasted NDP Leader Elizabeth Weir for her use of the abbreviated phrase saying the term BS tax is unparliamentary. The Bushan's fifth edition, uh, it says since 1958 it's been ruled unparliamentary to use the following expressions. One of them is bullshit. <laughs> now we all know, Mr. Speaker, the common expression BS. So I don't have the vaguest idea what this government is going to call the tax. And if they want to call it the bullshit tax, that's their prerogative. Now, the House Speaker ruled in Ray Frenette's favor, so from now on, the controversial new tax can only be referred to in the House as the Harmonized Sales Tax, or HST. Nova Scotia taxpayers got a chance to speak out about Nova Scotia's new blended sales tax today. Public hearings got underway just a day after the Savage government passed second reading on the bill. Many of those speaking at the hearings today before the Law Amendments Committee are opposed to the tax. And they're asking some pretty tough questions, too. Is this blended sales tax actually a cruel attempt to patch up a bad law, the GST, by imposing another bad law, the blended sales tax? Trying to pretend that blending taxes is the same as killing the GST is an effort to keep an election promise, and it will not work. Canadians are not as stupid as you think. The people will get the revenge for this injustice at the next election. And these hearings continue tomorrow. Then the bill goes back to the House for third and final Small reading. Manufacturers are on the rope. There's a new twist on the St. John amalgamation debate tonight. An advantage for residents of the Cases Valley. Now, most residents of KV oppose the higher taxes and the loss of control that the merger would bring. But it seems there is some support for the improved public transit that would also result. Here's ATV's Connell Smith tonight. This is a familiar situation for Rose Savoy. 
if she wants to get anywhere, she must take a taxi or call a friend. Okay. Today, she's traveling from her Fairvale apartment to a Quispamsis church to do Christmas volunteer work for needy families. Savoy would really welcome public transit. I would use it to go for doctor's appointments. I would be able to go shopping. And uh, I would like to be able to go to places like the Abex Center. She says there are many poor, elderly, and teens who would also benefit. You know how to drink like big boys. Richard Green recently moved to Fairvale from the Montreal area. He assumed there would be bus service. I think if we ran it, any metropolitan city would extend their bus service to the, the uh, suburbs. As it is now, this is ridiculous. Green says it costs $30 taxi fare for a round trip to St. John. The end of the line for St. John Transit's Forest Glen bus. This east side street is as close as public transit gets to Fairvale. If St. John did amalgamate with its suburbs, city transit's mandate requires that bus service be extended as well. That would present a challenge, but there are ways that it could be done. You would go out throughout the communities in the morning to get to the end of the line, and then you would express in the Mackay Highway, stopping at parking lots that would be located at the different exits along the way. Frank McCary says transit could be extended without amalgamation, but only on a more expensive, strictly for profit basis. In St. John, Connell Smith, ATV News. Flowers were placed today near a small store in Halifax where a man was murdered on the weekend. Ali Sharif Razi was stabbed to death. On Sunday, a memorial service for the murder victim will be held in Dartmouth by the Islamic Association of the Maritime Provinces. A trust fund is being set up to help pay the cost of returning his body to Iran. A Nova Scotia prosecutor is criticizing a Supreme Court justice tonight. Craig Botterill is upset over the sentence handed to 22-year-old Frank Wadden, the first person convicted of pimping a boy in Nova Scotia. Wadden received 18 months in a group home in Cumberland County, was ordered to undergo psychiatric counseling and take vocational training. Botterill, who has prosecuted Nova Scotia pimps for three years, says the sentence in this case is inconsistent. If you pimp children, uh, you go to the federal penitentiary. Uh, this decision seems to be a break with those other precedent-setting cases. You don't think that's good? Well, strong deterrent sentences have worked. We see fewer prostitutes on the streets in Metro. We see fewer people involved in the pimping business. Wadden's lawyer, Luann Thompson, says the sentence is appropriate because her client and the 16-year-old boy had a relationship and because Wadden did not depend entirely on the money the boy brought in. The captain of this Japanese fishing vessel has pleaded not guilty to shark finning. The captain was arrested by fisheries officers earlier this week and charged with discarding shark carcasses. He faces a maximum fine of $100,000 if he is found guilty. New Brunswick Solicitor General Jane Barry is giving flabby police officers two years to get in shape. That is one item in a proposal on new policing standards introduced by Barry today. These new standards cover virtually every aspect of policing, from financial management to physical fitness of the officers. Jane Barry wants the officers to pass a fitness test every two years. She won't say what will happen if they don't meet the standards. It will be candlelit services for a number of churches in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia this weekend. The Nova Scotia Power Corporation is pulling the plug on Valley customers on Sunday morning to make some repairs. Now, this move comes at what is traditionally the busiest time in the year for many churches, the lead-up to Christmas. ATV's Peter Millett in the Valley tonight. In the heart of rural Nova Scotia, the church is often the center of the community. Here in the Annapolis Valley, a planned four-hour power outage by Nova Scotia Power Sunday morning has many community members outraged, and the minister of this United Baptist Church frustrated. But most people, when they're there on Sunday morning, they, they contribute to the church. If they're not there, they don't make it up the next week. Some people do, but most people don't. And that hurts us, not only in running our churches, but nowadays churches are being called upon to shoulder a, a larger and larger a part of helping people in need. Now it's Mark Parent who's the one in need. But members of Mark Parent's congregation are rallying to make sure that Sunday's service isn't scrapped. People Don't like Bob Wright, who's it. donating his gas-powered generator. Well, if it wasn't me, it'd be somebody else. I mean, there were a community of farmers around here. There's lots of generators. This isn't the first time churchgoers in the Annapolis Valley have been forced to go to church in the dark. 
I was amazed, really, when I called in to register my dismay that they were closing down all the churches on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. The reply was, oh, well, that doesn't make any difference. Nobody goes to church anymore anyway. I think a lot of people just don't think the church is very important anymore, and so they think, well, we can just put it on on a Sunday morning. And I think they're wrong. In the spirit of giving at this time of year, churchgoers here in the Canning area want Nova Scotia Power to give them a break by postponing Sunday's maintenance till the afternoon when church is out. But Nova Scotia Power says Sunday morning's the best time to do it. School's out, businesses are closed, and the least number of people will be affected. The only thing that could possibly change the power company's mind at this point is divine intervention. In Canning, Peter Millette, ATV News. Still to cover the ATV Evening News, some pre-Christmas mathematics for you. Now, before you go shopping this weekend, consider this. How you pay for what you buy will affect the final price. We'll do the math a bit later. But next. The GST. He also promised caucus on a number of occasions that he would scrap the Questions GST. about the Prime Minister's honesty we'll raised again in Ottawa, and in the Prime Minister himself. responds Mr. next. Talked about what went on in caucus and then misrepresented what Two-year study has turned up some problems with airbags, but Transport Canada says it may need another couple of years to study possible changes. The study found that drivers wearing seat belts have a much bigger chance of being hurt in low and moderate speed crashes if their cars are equipped with airbags. Still ahead here on the ATV Evening News tonight, meteorologist Steve Weagle with our weekend weather forecast, and also ATV's Jonathan Kay goes shopping for Christmas bargains, so please stay with us. Also, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, says Canadians are very confused about what it is that he promised to do with the goods and services tax. Faced with accusations he lied about scrapping the GST, Mr. Chrétien has insisted that he has nothing to apologize for. We go to ATV's Sean Poulter in Ottawa for the story. There is some confusion in the public. It's not to not tell the truth to the public. We Canadians may think they know what they heard Jean Chrétien promise in the last election, but the Prime Minister now says Canadians are confused. The confusion came from the fact that a lot of people in the land thought that we were just to abolish the GST and nothing else. And I could not say that. The confusion is apparently spreading. Yeah, I think he's lying. Oh, I'm concerned about the, his credibility yeah. and uh, the whole around this issue of the GST. I don't think he lied. I just think he screwed up. I didn't hear simpler, I heard scrapped. I mean, I it's been a tough week for the Prime Minister. His honesty questioned by ordinary Canadians and a fellow Liberal. He also promised caucus on a number of occasions that he would scrap the GST. Why can't the Prime Minister just admit that he has some shortcomings? There is no great shame in that. Just say sorry. In question period, the opposition renewed its attack, but the Prime Minister stayed away, leaving his finance minister to defend his leader's reputation. The context in which the Prime Minister has made his statements are very clear and they are a matter of record. That's not what Paul Martin said in his GST apology last spring. But we were mistaken. As Parliament adjourns for the Christmas break, the Liberals are hoping they can leave all this GST confusion behind them. But most people know what they hear, and they may not like hearing their Prime Minister tell them that any confusion is theirs, not his. In Ottawa, Sean Poulter, ATV News. And coming up next here on the ATV Evening News, some money-saving Christmas shopping tips. Happy spring, that's your 327. Jonathan Kay with advice on Christmas financing and why how you pay for those gifts makes all the difference. That's next. You know, a lot of people around here believe the best Christmas tree is the one you cut down yourself. And that's exactly what Brian and Shelley Rector from Stellarton were doing today at the McLeod Family Tree Farm. That's the family's dog, Dreyfus. He was barking his approval when they selected this nine-foot scotch pine. Nice tree. Well, you know, with new banking technology and some creative in-store financing plans, choosing how to pay for your Christmas shopping is almost as big a decision these days as choosing what to buy. The financial experts say which plan is best pretty much depends on your own personal finances. 
But as ATV's Jonathan Kay shows us here tonight, choosing the right one could save you quite a bit of money. Every time Heather Kidson makes a purchase this Christmas, she has to decide how to pay. Cash, credit card, debit card, or in-store financing plan. This time, it's credit card. It's a little expensive, and I thought I'd put it on Visa this time, but it'll be paid off next month. Not everyone manages to do that. At Nova Scotia Business and Consumer Services, Barbara Jones-Gordon says half of us end up carrying a balance. So if you don't stop at the store to consider which payment option is best, you could end up paying more than you should. You really have to shop around to find the best rate for you and the best payment option. For example, home computers are big sellers this year. $19.99 is a popular price. That's $23.75 after taxes. Maybe you'd like 12 monthly payments instead. On a department store card, that could cost close to $400 in interest. But if you plan ahead and arrange a line of credit at your bank, you could pay a quarter of that. Better still, if you could find the money to pay off the computer in six months, a no interest, no payments deal such as this one will cost you nothing. Most people today almost have to look at the methods of payment and determine which is best for them. It's almost a bit like getting investment advice. If you've already saved the money for your major Christmas purchase, Barbara Jones Gordon says instead of using your debit card or your checkbook, you should consider paying in cash. Sometimes cash will allow you to negotiate a slightly better deal. I never see. This uh, advice comes too late for Heather Kidson. With this purchase, her Christmas shopping is finished. But if you're still buying, a little advanced planning may help make the January bills a bit easier to bear. In Dartmouth, Jonathan Kay, ATV News. Oh, there'll be a lot of people shopping this weekend. We take a break, come back with meteorologist Steve Wiggles' weekend weather forecast next. Time now for meteorologist Steve Weagle and our Maritime Weekend Weather Forecast. Pretty good day in Nwidjewak today. It sure is, yeah. yeah. Well, generally cloudy across the Maritimes, but uh, temperature is above normal for this time of year, so very pleasant. Yeah, pretty good day all over. Really, I said to Peter Code on the uh, 1 o'clock newscast today, it feels very much like spring, very, very unusual mm -hmm. uh, to my uh, to my memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and really, we, it's been quite mild uh, this December so yeah. far, hasn't it? Sure has. All right, well, we're looking at a pleasant weekend for Christmas shoppers. Let's take a look at our big satellite shot up over North America first. And uh, interesting weather pattern going on around the continent right now. We've got a system just to the west of the Maritimes, which I've been talking about all week, week, and it looks like it's going to stay to the south and the west of us for the next couple of days. And in fact, we've got a deformation zone here where the cloud and the precipitation is spreading out in a north-south direction with a ridge of high pressure all the way up into Newfoundland and Labrador, extending down into the Maritimes. Although with the onshore breeze, we're starting to see uh, light drizzle and freezing drizzle where temperatures drop below the freezing mark. The jet stream pattern all the way down into, uh, well, generally the southeast of the U.S., northern Florida, and this cold air is going to remain in place the next couple of days. But this system, with its moisture, will stay back to the west as we head into Saturday and Sunday. And that's good news for us. So we're looking at pretty good road conditions the next 24 hours. Here's a look at the satellite shot. There are really two reasons for the cloud and the precipitation today. We've got that weird trough moving from Newfoundland and Labrador into the Maritimes, and you can see how it really starts to break up as it pushes across the Maritime provinces, and the onshore breeze from the northeast, keeping a lot of cloud around, especially along the coast, and that's going to continue for the next few hours. So, patchy uh, freezing drizzle in New Brunswick, where temperatures are at the freezing mark, or just slightly below, and a patchy drizzle throughout the rest of the Maritimes, generally around the freezing mark in most areas. Watch out for black ice tonight. Mainly cloudy tomorrow with the onshore breeze, 3 to 5 for daytime highs. New Brunswick looking at the same conditions, but very pleasant. Uh, cloudy, but temperatures very mild, 2 and 3 for daytime highs. And the rest of the weekend, some sunshine expected on Sunday. Not a lot, but a sunny break here and there. The same for Monday. And then showers start to push in on Tuesday. Very mild, 6 degrees expected. For New Brunswick all three days, uh, generally the same here. On